Let me introduce you to transformations by showing you a quick overview of some of the things you'll learn in this lesson. Here I've graphed the function y equals the square root of x, and just for reference, I plotted a couple points, 4 comma 2 and 0 comma 0. So what I'm going to do is take my equation, square root of x, and in this video I'm going to add, subtract, and multiply constants in various locations in the equation and show you the effect on the graph. So for example, if I was to take the square root function, x is my input to my function, and the square root of x is my output. Look what happens if I took my old function in purple and added 2 to the output, then the purple graph would be transformed into the orange graph, and it's clear to me that all of my points got shifted up 2. For example, 0, 0 is now 0, 2, and 4, 2 is now 4, 4. If I wanted to move the purple graph down 2, I could have simply subtracted 2 on the output, and my original function in purple would have been transformed into the orange, and they're related in such that the orange graph is 2 units down relative to the purple. So instead of having 4, 2, for example, that point got mapped to 4, 0. Now let me show you that if you were to add 2 or subtract 2 to the input of the function, not the output, meaning I want to add 2 to x, such that the plus 2 occurs under the radical. So think of it as the 2 is being added to the input of the function as opposed to adding 2 to the output. Now my original graph in purple has been transformed to the orange graph and the relationship looks like the orange graph was obtained by taking the purple graph and shifting it to the left 2. So for example, 4 comma 2 got moved to the left and is now 2 comma 2 on my transformed function. And if you want, 0 comma 0 has been moved to negative 2 comma 0. In contrast, had I wanted my orange graph to be a transformation of the purple to the right 2 units, I could have subtracted 2 to the input, and indeed my graph would have been moved to the right 2 units. 0, 0 becomes 2 comma 0. 4 comma 2 becomes 6 comma 2. Let me show you a few more. Another transformation I want to look at is if you were to take a function, here's its output, if I were to multiply it by a negative 1, what that would do is change the signs on my outputs. So for example, all of my outputs have the opposite sign. So for example, 4 comma 2 has an output of 2, since I changed the sign on the output from 2 to negative 2, 4 comma 2 gets mapped down here to 4 comma negative 2. The x values are the same, but the output has changed its sign. It's exactly what I did over here. I did not change the input. This was x, this was x, but I did change the output such that its sign would change. This is called an x-axis reflection. You can think about it this way. Suppose you took a blank piece of paper and took wet purple paint and painted this shape, then folded the piece of paper about the x-axis. That paint would come down here and smudge, although it would be purple, not orange, but it would have this shape down here. So the next transformation I'd like to look at would be, what if you didn't fold the piece of paper about the x-axis, what if you had purple wet paint over here in this shape, and you folded the piece of paper about this axis here, the y-axis. This can be obtained by not changing the sign on the output, but changing the sign on the input. So here's my input x. I want to change its sign by putting a negative out there. And indeed, we get exactly what I said. If this was wet purple paint and we folded the piece of paper about the y-axis, this paint would smudge over here. And you can think of it as, if you wanted the y values to stay the same, you would have to change the sign on the x. So for example, this point has a y value of 2. If you looked at the point over here whose y value is 2, you'll notice that the x value is the same except opposite in sign. Instead of 4, it is negative 4. So this time, the signs on the inputs change, but the signs on the output do not. So we refer to this as a y-axis reflection. It's important not to use words like mirror image. The phrase mirror image does not distinguish between whether you're reflecting about the x-axis, the y-axis, or some other arbitrary line. Let me squeeze in two last transformations. They're a little bit different. They're called non-rigid transformations. So far we've manipulated the purple graph in a way as if it was made out of steel and could not be morphed or stretched, if you will, in any way. We simply picked it and moved it up, down, left, and right and reflected about the x and y axis. In my last two examples we multiplied 
by a negative 1, I'd like to look at what would happen if you took your output and instead of multiplying by a negative 1, you multiplied by the number 3. What would happen here is that my output, square root of x, has now been tripled. We took the square root of x, the output, and tripled it. So what happens is the x values, or my inputs, stay the same, but my y values are tripled. So, for example, if you were to focus at this point here, it has an x value of 4. If you kept x the same and looked on the orange graph, notice that the x value is 4, but my y value is tripled. Instead of having an output of 2, my output is now 3 times that, namely 6. So if you were to keep an x value the same, they're both 4, your output would triple simply by the fact that I took my output of my function and multiplied by 3. One thing to note here is that any points on the x-axis are a special case and that when you take the output of any point on the x-axis, it'll always be zero. And since we're in the business of tripling the output, tripling my output of zero gives you zero still because zero times any number is zero. So notice that point does not change. The purple and the orange graph, my old and my new function, share that point. This would be true for any x-intercept. This is called a vertical scaling. Because my y values got bigger, this is referred to as a stretch or a dilation. I'd like to show you what would happen if our goal wasn't to make the graph larger, so to speak, but we wanted to compress it. So instead of stretching the purple graph, suppose I wanted to compress it, as if I was pushing down on it towards the x-axis. This could be done by multiplying your output by a number smaller than 1. In my last example, I put a 3 there, which is bigger than 1. Multiplying by numbers bigger than 1 makes the outputs bigger. But suppose I wanted to take my output and make it smaller by multiplying by, say, a half or 0.5. By doing so, notice that the orange graph can be obtained by thinking of it as we're compressing the purple graph in such a way that we were keeping the inputs the same. I did not change the input. But what I did is I took the output, square root of x, and multiplied by 0.5. So if you compare this point to this point, it looks like on the orange graph, this would be the point 4, 1. So it did exactly what I said. The x values do not change, but my output got multiplied by a half. 2 times a half is 1. And again, we have this anchor point over here, or the point that does not move, because when you multiply its output by a half, it remains 0. Notice this holds true for all points on the graph. For example, to look at another point, look at the point 9, 3 on the original function. If you plug in x equals 9, you get the principal root of 9 is 3. What I did is take my function and multiply its output by a half. So the output of 3 should be multiplied by a half, and it should be a y value of about 1.5. And if you scroll over, you can see it is 1.5. Looking at points that have the same input, notice that the outputs got cut in half. This is just a quick overview of transformations. In this lesson, you'll be combining these transformations together so that in a given problem, you'll be doing more than one at a time. What a cool area of mathematics.